Okay, we are in our third of four weeks uh, sermon series on Rob Bell's book, Love Wins. Uh, Most of you are aware Rob Bell is a 41-year-old evangelical preacher who um, started to struggle with a few of the teachings from his evangelical tradition and had the courage to ask the question, what if there is no hell? And when that happened, uh, evangelical leaders throughout this country had a fit and were found within all different types of media being interviewed, having to do with this book, how it is blasphemous, and frankly, Rob Bell is going to hell for writing this book. Got so much press, it made the New York Times bestseller list, at which time Rob Bell ended up on television stations and in Newsweek and Time Magazine with the opportunity to talk about why he did what he did. And he actually interviews very well. And we are looking at this book not because we think it has all the answers, but because it asks interesting questions. And the first week we talked about this, one of the things we talked about is how blessed we are within the United Methodist Church that we are not only encouraged to ask the big questions, but expected to do so expected to do so. And so this is a good thing to do. We also had said that had this been written by a United Methodist pastor, word for word, it probably would have never made the bestseller list, not because it's not good, but nobody would have had a fit about it. So that is why we are looking at this book. And today's sermon is called Embedded Fear, God as Judge. And the names of all the sermons from this sermon series came from a Saturday worship steering committee meeting where we looked at um, a video of Rob Bell preaching for about, it's a short video, it's called um, Bullhorn. And it's really the seed of this book. And I showed it to the folks on the steering committee and asked them, what do you think? There's a book that fleshes this out. Do you think it would be interesting if we looked at it? Would you like to talk about it? And I told them that what they shared in that meeting would be confidential, and we had a really wonderful and very honest and open conversation. And as words were flying around, I was writing things down, and embedded fear, God as judge, is something that came up, and I realized that is one thing that we really need to look at. Before we get started, I just let me just read just a short part of chapter 4, where Rob Bell is talking about websites, church websites. He goes to these church websites to find out what they're like. You know, if you were going to, you're not, you come to Manchester, but if you were in a different town, if you moved and you were looking for a new church, one of the ways you might do that is get online and see what their website has to say about what they believe. And he goes on to say most of these also list, uh, uh, have a section on what people in the church believe, about the people who don't believe what they believe. I don't think we have one of those on our website, but, but I love the way he says that. It includes a section on what people in the church believe about the people who don't believe what they believe. So this is from an actual church website, quote, the unsaved will be separated forever from God in hell. This is from another. Those who don't believe in Jesus will be sent to eternal punishment in hell. And this is another. The unsaved dead will be committed to an eternal conscious punishment. So in the first statement, the unsaved won't be with God. In the second, not only will they not be with God, but they'll be sent somewhere else to be punished. In the third, we're told that not only these unsaved will be punished forever, but they will be fully aware of it in case we were concerned they might down an ambient or two when God wasn't looking. The people experiencing this separation and punishment will feel all of it, we are told, because they'll be fully conscious of it fully awake and aware for every single second of it, as if, as it never lets up for billions and billions of years. And he goes on to say, all this on a website, welcome to our church. <laughs> oh my gosh, I mean, that's just frightening stuff. And in, in his preface, I think this follows up what we're going to talk about today. But in his preface, um, he says, I've written this book for all of those everywhere who have heard some version of the Jesus story that caused their pulse rate to rise, their stomach to churn, and their heart to utter those resolute words, I would never be a part of that. Okay? Well, I think some of that website stuff, we might feel I would never be a part of that. 
Wow, they are talking about an angry, angry God. A God of judgment, a God of fear, and we're not talking fear as in awestruck. We're talking as in you better be very afraid of this God. And I'm wondering, for all the people, all the Christians throughout the world who really do primarily understand God as judge, what's some of the ways you understand God? You may very well be one of those people for whom God is judge is the primary attribute you think of. It might also be God as creator. That's a big one. It might be for some of you who are in a in a in a relationship that feels this way, God as friend. Some people consider God as friend. There's a lot of different ways to understand God. A very, very common one in this church is God as Father. When Jesus talked about God as Father, the word he was using translates actually as Abba. And the best way we we can translate that in the English language is Daddy. It's a very um, warm, um, uh, like like a little child would call their, their, their biological father, Daddy. It's not Father. When we look at the word Father in the English language, it tends to carry with it a great deal of authority. It tends to carry with it the idea of disciplinarian. It's authoritative. It's large and in charge. Most kids don't call their biological father, father. And as, as much as we say, well, I, I think of God as father, but I, but I think of God as a loving father, that may be very true. The word Father, though, we are really affected by the words and the language that we use. And Father is really a very formal thing to call God when what Jesus was calling him was Daddy. Okay? And we're really, we're really influenced by that. So, see, I think for some people, even if you don't think of God as judge, if you feel very strongly about the idea of God as Father, That's absolutely fine. Please don't think I don't think that's great. It's great. But depending on who your human father was, depending on your experience of father, you may actually experience God as father not a whole lot different than God as judge. If your experience of father is one of tremendous authority and discipline and large and in charge, Hard to please, difficult, angry sometimes. I mean, a lot of people have experienced fathers like that. Our fathers are human. But if that's how you feel about God as father, if that was your experience, you may very well have kind of this sense of God as judge going on in you. And I'm not telling you that's wrong either. None of this I'm telling you is wrong. It's up to you to decide what you think. So I've struggled with this sermon a little bit because when I think of God as father, I never have really thought of God as judge, but when I think of God as father and I think about my own father, I always felt unconditionally loved by my dad. And I really think one of the reasons I can believe in a God of unconditional love is because my own My own dad was like that. Now, does that mean that he just let me get away with anything? There were no rules? No, of course not. Loving father has rules, expectation, curfews, you know? And when I would screw up, he'd let me know. But you know what? He'd tell me one time. He'd assume I heard him, and he'd move on. He wouldn't hold a grudge. And so when I think of God as father, it's hard for me to imagine a God who would be less than my own dad. I was never afraid of my dad, never, and always knew that he loved me. So I'm thinking about this, trying to get in the mindset of what it might feel like to be someone who sees God as judge, God as authoritative father figure, because there's so many of us who really feel that way. And I thought about when I was 18 years old and I was a senior in high school, 
And I, I grew up in Ames, Iowa. I've told you that before. You don't have to drive very far to be in the country. You're on the edge of town, and boop, you're in the country. And there was a guy in my high school whose family had a big barn, Carney's Barn, and I don't know, it seemed like every other Saturday night during the school year, there was a party out there. There was a party. There was a bonfire, and there was music, and yes, there were kegs. But it was a lot of fun, and there were a lot of kids who would show up for this. And I'd heard about it, and my friend Jill had heard about it, and we thought we would like to go out and just see what it was like. But at the same time, we wanted to make sure we could leave if we wanted to. So we needed a car. So my dad was good about letting me borrow the car, but he always wanted to know where I was going, right? So I screwed up my courage, and I went up to him, and I, and I said, Jill and I would like to go to the party out at Carney's Barn. And I told him exactly where it was. And I said, there'll be a bonfire, and there'll be lots of kids there, and there'll be music, and there'll be kegs. And I said, we would really like to go. And he asked me some more questions, and he finally said, no drinking, home by midnight, that'll be all right. So I called my friend Jill, and I said, I got the car. And she said, well, what did you tell your dad? And I said, I told him where we were going. And she said, you asked for the car to go to a kegger? And I said, <laughs> I need to teach you about salesmanship. <laughs> that is not how I worded it at all. But I told him, yeah, he knew. And I said, he said, as long as we don't drink and we're home by midnight, it's OK. Now, my friend Jill came from a very big family, boys and girls, Catholic. I'm not knocking the Catholic tradition. I'm just telling you. That's what she came from. And her own father was very, very difficult, very di actually one of the meanest men I've ever met, truly. I'm, I'm serious. He was really awful. He strongly favored her brothers, paid very little attention to the girls in the family. She was the youngest, so she really didn't count for much. She was beautiful and talented and tried to do all these things to impress her dad and get on his good side. It never worked out. He was very, very hard on her. And after I told her what I'd done with my own dad, and she was so envious of the relationship I had with my dad, she said, you talked to him like an adult. And I said, yes, I did. And he said, she said, and he treated you like an adult. And I said, yes, he did. And she said, OK, so I got in the car. I drove over to Jill's house. And as I pulled into the driveway, she was running out of the house. She got in the car, and she said, drive, just drive. Just get out of here, just drive. And she was crying. And I said, what happened? And she said, I went to my dad, and I told him the truth. And he hit her. He hit her. Called her a terrible name. And about that time, I drove into the driveway. And she ran out to get in the car. God is judge. OK. We went. We had a really good time. We didn't drink. We actually left a little early. And what I remember is driving around and around and around and around while she tried to come up with a story to tell her dad. Well, she tried to come up with a speech that would somehow lessen the punishment, because punishment was inevitable, and she didn't want to go home. And as I thought about that, I thought about how many of us live our lives in this world. And throughout our lives, we, we make decisions that we think at that moment are good decisions. And then time goes by, and we realize that probably wasn't a good decision. And we feel guilty. We feel bad. We feel like we've let God down. And we have this tendency to drive round and round and round and round, trying to come up with some kind of speech to tell God so we don't get punished. We've got so many folks who have regrets from so long ago. And I know we have a lot of people in here, not that I know that, you, but we all are like this. We have regrets. And sometimes it is just so hard to believe that our God is a God full of grace. It is so much easier to believe that this God is a God ready to punish, a God who's there to judge, a God like Jill's father, not like my dad, not grace-filled, not ready to treat you like an adult. You know, I ask those people, when they come to me, I say, 
have you asked for forgiveness for whatever this is that bo is bothering you? And they say, yes. And I say, then God has forgiven you. And they say, I know, but I can't forgive myself. And the thing is, you know, honestly, when you truly know that God has forgiven you here, you don't feel guilt anymore. It's easy to say you know God has forgiven you, but it's sometimes you don't believe it here. We're just sure that God is angry and disappointed and that when we show up, either we're going to get punished or we're going to show up and God won't be there at all. We'll go to God with whatever it is we need to talk about and God will have already left. God will have given up and just abandoned us. So sometimes then folks just decide to reject God before God can reject them. They give up on the church, they give up on God, they give up on all of that, and they decide it isn't necessary. Or we spend our lives trying to make up for a mistake we made. Never feeling fully forgiven, never fully forgiving ourselves, and we're living in a self-imposed hell when we're doing that. Because we think that's where God would have us, that God that holds eternal grudges. And I think Rob Bell brings up an interesting question in here when he says, is my eternal life determined by, and we're talking eternal life, determined by this finite bit of time I live in this world? I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm just saying he asks some interesting questions. Is my entire eternal life determined by a mistake I made in a finite moment in this life, which is a blip compared to our eternal life? A blip. Really? Do we really think that? See, Bell asks questions like, is that what Jesus taught? And then he goes back and he looks. Now, the scripture that we're looking at tonight <clears throat> is the prodigal son. And the prodigal son is scripture that, you know, you could have a 12-part sermon series on it and still have stuff to talk about. It is layer upon layer upon layer. It is just absolutely wonderful. And the prodigal son story actually follows in that same chapter. There's two, there's two other stories that are real short ones. And one is um, the, the one about the sheep or the, the shepherd that has 100 sheep and one, one is missing. So the shepherd leaves the 99 to go find the one. It's that important. It's that important that all get brought back to the fold. It's that important. And, of course, the shepherd represents God and the sheep, that's us. And there's another one where a woman has like 10 coins, I think it is, and she loses one, and she turns her house upside down looking for that coin, and when she finds it, she invites all her friends over for a party because she found the one coin. And, of course, the coins represent us, and the woman represents God. God will not give up the search. He will not let go of any coin, of any sheep, and then we go into the prodigal son. See, it's all the same message. It's just different ways of telling it. That's why... Jesus wants us so much to understand this. He just keeps telling us the same message in different ways. The prodigal son is a story most of you are familiar with. There is a father and his two sons. One's younger, one's older. They live on a farm. The younger son decides that he just doesn't want to live on the farm anymore. He just wants his inheritance, and he wants to go off and do what it is he wants to do. Now, first of all, the idea of anybody asking for their inheritance before their parent dies a little over the top, I think, you know. What's dad supposed to live on? But he goes ahead and he does it anyway. That's the audacity of this guy, all right? So the dad gives him his share of the inheritance, and this kid goes off, absolutely squanders it on, you know, wine, women, and song. And he ends up destitute, and he ends up working with the pigs. He's a Jew working with the pigs. That, again, was supposed to be, like, super bad, you know? He has nothing to eat but leftover slop. I mean, this is so gross. And he finally thinks to himself, wow, my dad has servants who live so much better than this. I could go back home, and I, I will not expect to be treated like a son, but I'll just say to my dad, if you would just take me back as one of your servants, then I would have food to eat and a roof over my head. So he starts back home. And all the way home, he's practicing his, his speech. He's practicing, practicing his speech because... He is absolutely convinced there will be punishment. He will be punished when he gets there. So he, he wants to be ready for this. He wants to be ready. From a distance, his father sees him coming down the road. 
and is so excited, he runs down the path to meet his son. And in this time, in this culture, men did not run. Maybe only to save their lives, but they did not run. It was completely undignified. Never. You would never run as a man. He ran to meet his son. He did not care what it looked like. He gets to his son, his son's just starting his speech, and his dad just grabs him in his arms and tells him he's so thrilled to have him home, gets him back to the house, tells his, his servant, get this kid in the shower, get him a new set of clothes, get him a new set of shoes, put a ring on his finger, kill the fatted calf, we are having a party. He's home. He's home. That's grace. That is grace. And the father in this story of course, is God. And that is grace. That is grace. But the story's not over, right? Because we've got the elder son, bless his heart. He'd been working in the field all day long. Now, you've got to understand, when his brother left, he took part of the funds from the household, right? And there was extra work that had to be done when he went, which very possibly the elder son had to pick up. The elder son would not be too impressed with the younger son and what he did. He's coming toward the house, and he's exhausted. He's worked all day, and he hears music. And he's smelling a little fatted calf on the spit. And he's, and he's thinking, what is going on? And one of the servants there said, your brother's come home, and your dad's throwing him a party. And the elder son says, yeah, great. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He is so angry. And you know what? If we're honest, we would be too. <laughs> Amen. We'd be angry. We would be so angry. This guy stuck around, helped out his dad, worked himself to the bone, and he, and he says to his dad, and you never even let me have like a dinner party for my friends. Never. This isn't fair. This isn't fair. And the father says, but son, you've been with me all the time. Everything I have is yours. Do you know, every time we study this passage in Disciple or in Companions in Christ, we find out pretty quickly who in the classroom is an elder child and who's a prodigal. <laughs> because we land in one of those two camps. We really do. Now, for the most part, folks in church, in general, for the most part, folks in church are the elder son, and they recognize that in themselves. They are the elder son. They are people who, for the most part, have done their best to follow the rules and do the right thing and honor their parents and raise their kids well and do everything the way God would have them do it. And then there's a group, uh, you know, we know we're prodigals when we're prodigals. I know that. I didn't find God until I was like 38 years old. I know that. I know that. We know when we're prodigals, and there's, you know, that's nothing to be excited about either. But the cool thing is, you know, God wants us all. And I would sit in a classroom. I remember the first time this happened, I was in Disciple 2. And I was with this group of people I just loved, and we came upon this scripture and this woman who I just still think the world of. She's just wonderful. We got through this, and she said, you know what? This really bugs me. She said, all my life I have tried to do the right thing. All my life. She said, I've been going to church every Sunday since I was born. She said, I've raised my kids right. I've done all the right things. I didn't party when I was a kid. I blah, 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 blah. And then she said, and then somebody comes along who decides they want to find God. And God says, okay, and they're even with me. Are you <laughs> kidding me? They're even with me? That's not right. I mean, it and I said, whoo, wow. And I thought, I'm one of those people. <laughs> I'm one of those people. I didn't admit it. I was afraid I'd get whacked. But, <laughs> but you really start to see, you know, and I do understand because, frankly, prodigals who find God turn into elder children pretty darn quick, you know? I mean, and I think sometimes there's almost a part of us that wishes God was a judging God sometimes. Sometimes. Not directed at us, of course. But directed at those people who are not pulling their own weight, who aren't doing the things they should do. You know, when we've been towing the line all this time and doing things just the way God would have us do it, and somebody just comes along and decides they want in, and God says, okay, 
what? That does make us mad. And you know what? It's good for us to recognize that. It's good for us to recognize that within ourselves. It's a natural tendency. And what's cool is these stories that Jesus told more than 2,000 years ago, hey, they're fresh. I mean, they still hold true. Human beings have just not changed all that much. And the thing is, you know, whether we are elder sons, elder children, and we know if we are, or we are prodigals, we need, we need to remember that God loves those prodigals. God loves the elder sons as well, but the elder sons, the prodigals know God loves the elder sons. The elder sons are not always so sure. We need to remember that God loves those living with the pigs. God loves those who are in self-imposed hell. God loves those who are selfish and self-absorbed. God does love those who are selfish and self-absorbed. God loves those who take and do not give. God loves those who show no compassion toward their neighbor, but live only in the most destructive ways. God loves those people. They are the lost coin. They are the lost sheep. They are the prodigal. They are lost. And God, according to this scripture, does not give up until they are found. And I think if we can really get our heads and hearts around that, and it's hard, it's then that we understand the Great Commission taken from the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always till the end of the age. Wow. Does this sound like an angry, judging God to you? Or does this sound like a God who absolutely will not give up, is determined not to lose a single soul, will not give up until everybody has come home and we'll have a party. Amen. <laughs>